This is Lecture 5 in the series Capital, the Productive Process, and the Rate of Profit. The nominal rate of profit we've established is equal, or more accurately, I should say, tends to be equal, tends to be equal to the rate of net consumption, which is simply the amount of net consumption divided by the amount of capital. It's equal to the rate of net consumption plus approximately the rate of increase in the quantity of money. The nominal rate of profit, the amount of profit divided by the amount of capital, tends to equal the amount of net consumption divided by the amount of capital plus approximately the rate of increase in the quantity of money. Now, um, in connection with that last portion, it was called to my attention that my table six was uh, mistaken uh, in one important area, uh, the figures for capital. When, uh, this is on page 16, when those figures are corrected, uh, then the result is much closer to um, the rate of profit increasing by a further component equal to the rate of increase in the quantity of money. In that column K, the correct amounts of capital uh, should be read from table three. The amount is correct in year one, 1800. Then it should be 1900, not 1980. It should be 1900, and then only in year three should it be 1980. I'm sorry, um, in, year, in year three, it's 2090. In year two, it's 1900, and it's 2090. In year four, it's 2299. In year five, it's 10% more than that. So it's 1900 in year two, 2090 in year three, and 2299 in year four. And in year five, uh, uh, two, how much? Twenty-five ninety-nine. You said twenty-five. Twenty-five twenty-nine. Twenty-five twenty-nine. And if you divide those adjusted amounts of capital, which are the correct ones, into uh, the item profit plus the increase in the quantity of money you'll find uh, a higher rate of profit than 20.22. It'll be something higher. And then when you subtract the initial rate of 11.11, the difference will be very close to 10%, very close to the increase in the quantity of money. Well, I don't consider this a full proof, but um, it's a reasonable indication. And so I think it could be established uh, that the rate of profit tends to equal the rate of net consumption, the, which is the amount of net consumption divided by the amount of capital, plus the rate of increase in the quantity of money. If we have an invariable money, there's no rate of increase in the quantity of money, so the rate of profit tends to equal the rate of net consumption alone. Now, the real rate of profit what the, the money rate of profit can actually buy, your actual rate of gain, that should be expressed as uh, the real rate of profit tends to equal the net consumption rate plus the rate of increase in production and supply. The real rate of profit tends to equal the net consumption rate plus the rate of increase in production and supply. If production and supply and the quantity of money and volume of spending are moving all at the same rate, then the nominal and real rate of profit will be equal. Uh, if we have no increase in money and we have a net consumption rate and production and supply are increasing, the real rate of profit will be greater than 
the nominal rate, it'll be greater because prices will fall. All right, I offer this as a kind of uh, recapitulation. I hope it hasn't added confusion. Uh, the basic idea is the rate of profit in an invariable money tends to equal the rate of net consumption. When we allow for the increase in the quantity of money, the rate of profit takes on an additional component which tends, at least as a close approximation, to equal the rate of increase in the quantity of money. And the real rate of profit uh, always has, as, as one of its components, the rate of increase in production and supply. Under an invariable money, that works to reduce prices and to enlarge the buying power of whatever capital plus profit you've got. Now, uh, this point has an important immediate application, which happens to be the next one on uh, page 20, taking up right from where we left off. Now, uh, if you look at figure 4, we're going to do this in connection with looking at figure 4, and you consider what is happening to real income. What's happening to the real income of everybody? Each year in figure 4, total wages are 300 paid to a number of workers equal to 1L. There's 1L workers. Well, that might be 50 million workers, 100 million workers, some definite number of workers. They're paid 300 units of money. Each unit could be a billion dollars or five billion dollars, some definite amount. All right, the wage earners receive the same total wages. The same total number of workers receive the same total wages. What is happening to real wages in figure four? They're going up each year by virtue of the rise in production, which reduces the prices of the goods they buy. So real wages are rising. What's happening to the nominal rate of profit after, from year three on? The nominal rate stays the same. What's happening to the buying power of that nominal rate, the buying power of this fixed 100 amount of profit? That's going up. Everybody is gaining in real terms. All right. Now, when we allow for an increase in the quantity of money, the nominal rate of profit would be somewhat higher. Uh, the real rate of profit, as we've established, depends on the rate of increase in production. Now, let's consider the fact uh, how upset people are about profits to the extent that the real rate of profit reflects the increase in production or the increase in the quantity of money, if the, nom the nominal rate of profit reflects the increase in the quantity of money, what are they being upset about? Well, they don't know that. They have the idea that the making of profit has some kind of significance that's coming out of their hides. Now, in reality, the nominal rate of profit, to some significant degree, is merely, the, is merely registering the increase in the quantity of money. A, a significant component of the nominal rate of profit merely registers the increase in the quantity of money. And a very significant component of the real rate of profit is merely registering the rate of increase in production. Now, try to imagine a condition in which we have a low rate of net consumption, of the lowest rate of net consumption we can have, the most rapid rate of increase in production. What will be the main elements determining the nominal and real rate of profit? It, it'll be the increase in production and the increase in the quantity of money. Now, 
can such profits in any conceivable sense be at the expense of anybody? <clears throat> the increase, the real rate of profit, what's happening to, what's the effect of the increase in the real rate of profit? There's more production, lower prices. It shows up as the increase in the supply. In large part, it's the increase in the supply of consumer goods the wage earners will have either this year or next year. And it's the increase in the supply of capital goods which makes possible an increase both in consumer goods and capital goods next year. Uh, to, the, to this extent, the resentment against profit is a resentment against the increase in wealth that works to the benefit of everybody in the economic system. It's a resentment against what is actually the foundation of the rise in real wages. Now suppose you, for whatever reason, were someone who had concluded you'd like to see the capitalists uh, consume the least, devote the most of their wealth to productive expenditure, to have the most rapid rate of increase in production. If that were your goal, to have the lowest possible personal consumption of the capitalists, the most rapid increase in production, what would be the implied appropriate course of behavior? Should you be out there threatening the lives and property of the capitalists, or should you be in favor of making them feel as secure as possible? Let's consider what is the effect on the rate of net consumption in Latin America of the activity of guerrilla bands, uh, the Tupameros, I think they were called in Uruguay. Uh, what is the effect of that sort of activity on the rate of net consumption? It elevates it. And what's the effect of that on the interests of the average wage earner? It goes down. These people are actively combating the uh, standard of living of the average person. Anyone who wants to support the standard of living of the average person should be absolutely in favor of the security of property and property rights, and uh, in favor of removing all regulations that stand in the way of the most efficient use of capital. Well, that's the substance of my lecture, everybody's stake in capitalism, too. Now. Um, this basic framework, I, I consider figure four as representing the essentials of the uh, overall, quote, macroeconomic, unquote, workings of a capitalist economy. I consider figure four as giving major insight into the full, broad-scale workings of a capitalist economy. And, a major uh, implication that follows from figure four is that the entire Marxian exploitation theory has everything upside down. Uh, I've spelled that out in detail at our conference four years ago, and it's on the tape series introduction. Uh, I'm sorry, not, this one was two years ago. Uh, a theory of productive activity, saving, and profit. If you look at the logic of figure four, and you consider what would happen if the businessmen and capitalists started consuming more and more and productively expending less and less, well, what's happening to the rate of net consumption and the rate of profit? It's going up. And suppose we had no businessmen or capitalists. Suppose everybody who's selling his products turns around and simply consumes the proceeds. then 100% of the sales proceeds become profit. Wages disappear. There's no capital. The rate of profit is infinite. Well, Adam Smith and Karl Marx had it completely backwards. They thought in the early and rude state of society, all income was wages. Everything was perfectly just and fine. Then capitalism emerges, and profits are deducted from what was originally all wages. Profits are a rake-off from wages. The reality is, if we have workers producing and selling products, they have sales proceeds. If they haven't acted capitalistically, if they haven't made any productive expenditures, there are no costs. 
the whole sales proceeds are profit. When capitalists appear and productive expenditure begins, what the capitalists are responsible for is productive expenditure, which includes wage payments, and as a result of expenditures for wages and for capital goods, costs of production emerge, which are a deduction from sales revenues. Uh, the more economically capitalistic the economy, in the sense of the more the buying for the sake of selling relative to the sales revenues, the less is the rate of net consumption, and the less is the rate of profit, as far as it depends on net consumption. Capitalists create wages, reduce the share of national income that stands as profit, and raise real wages and real profits. Well, that uh, I elaborate on, as I say, in the series from the last TJS. And the whole theory of wages that I developed that I call the productivity theory of wages, uh, showing that real wages depend on the productivity of labor, and ultimately that depends on the values of freedom and reason, with uh, the relative demand for capital goods standing in between, and technological progress and innovation. All of that can be derived from uh, figure four. And in essence, that's how I arrived at it. Uh, I saw figure four fairly early on in my career. I came to it and then uh, drew all kinds of inferences from it. All right, I don't want to go any further uh, on the question of the exploitation theory or the productivity theory of wages. They're both contained in the two previous uh, sets of recordings from uh, my lectures here at TJS in 87 and 85. Now, one thing I want to be sure to explain is what I refer to as the fundamental neutrality of technological progress. This is with respect to the rate of profit. And this is described on page 20. <clears throat> In figure four, technological progress goes on year after year after year. It's responsible for the uh, continuing increase in production. It's responsible for the growing supply of capital goods not encountering diminishing returns. Well, now the question is, does technological progress raise the rate of profit? Many people leap to the conclusion that it does, because in certain important particular contexts, it actually does. For example, let's uh, imagine uh, a computer company next month announces it's got an 8486 computer. This would be the most advanced. That it is able to produce at a cost that other companies are selling the present most advanced computer at, and it will roughly match their price. So here's a company that's found a way to produce this much more advanced computer at the same cost and sell it at the same price that uh, all the other computer companies are selling their less advanced computer for. All right, what would happen to the profits of that company? They would skyrocket, right? All right, now from the perspective of any individual company, introducing a technological advance is certainly the source of boosting your profits. But does it follow that technological progress raises the average rate of profit in the economic system? Because if you consider this very example, what is the effect on the rate of profit of all the other computer companies that haven't introduced the advance? That'll go, go way down. Now, the uh, connection between technological progress at the level of an individual company and its rate of profit is, insofar as it is an innovator, insofar as it is one of the early adopters of the advance, it will add to its profits. But now suppose everybody comes out with the advance. Does that, do you make a profit today because you produce an 8386 computer? I mean, everybody is offering 8386 computers. The first companies to do it had an advantage. Does any automobile company make any special profit because it has a self-starter in its cars? But the first companies that had self-starters made a profit. Well, the connection 
between technological progress and the rate of profit is that those who are early in adopting the advance have a higher rate of profit insofar as being early gives them some competitive advantage. But by the same token, those who are laggard have a reduction in the rate of profit or could be wiped out altogether. From the point of view of the economy as a whole, technological progress is neutral. The early adopters raise their profit, the laggards take a reduction in profit or suffer an outright loss. Uh, and of course then the laggards will try to catch up their losses or reduced profits will catch up the premium profits will be uh, wiped out until fresh advances are adopted and I go into this in the government against the economy the uh, dynamic implications of the of the profit motive but as far as the average rate of profit in the economy as a whole goes technological progress is neutral we can only make one indirect connection, and that is if we have a metallic money system, if we have some commodity money, to the extent that technological progress takes place in the production of the monetary commodity and thus increases the quantity of money, to that extent technological progress can add something to the rate of profit. But it's only by virtue of being the source of an increase in the quantity of money. It's not the case that technological progress in the production of ordinary goods adds to the average rate of profit. It adds to those who are ahead, takes away from those who are behind. It's only technological progress in the production of the monetary commodity that uh, works to have any effect on the economy-wide average rate of profit, along, uh, by the, the chain of explanation already covered. All right, now, uh, let me make some further applications of the net consumption theory. And now we'll be over on page 21, analysis of the effects of taxation and government budget deficits on the average rate of profit. To whatever extent the government imposes taxes that are paid with funds which otherwise would have been productively expended. The effect is to raise the pre-tax average rate of profit. To whatever extent the government imposes taxes that are paid with funds that otherwise would have been used to buy capital goods or pay the wages of workers in business firms, the effect is going to be to raise the pre-tax rate of profit. Let's just think why. Let's say the government imposes 100 of taxes that businesses are going to have to pay, and the businesses pay the 100 in taxes uh, by means of reducing their expenditure for capital goods and labor combined by 100. All right, if product, whatever productive expenditure was to begin with, what's it going to be now? It'll be less by 100. Now, the government, we can assume, is gracious enough to spend that 100 in buying things or giving money to people to buy things. What is the effect on total business sales revenues if we look at all sales revenues combined? They, they will stay the same, won't they? Business spends less for capital goods. It pays its workers less or has fewer workers. They spend less. Business and the wage earners generate less business sales revenue, but the government pays just as much more. Business pays, let's say, 80 less in buying capital goods, 20 less in paying wages. The wage earners consume 20 less. Business takes in 100 less of sales revenues from itself and its own employees, but it takes in 100 more from the government. So total sales revenues are the same, Productive expenditure is less. All right, well, what's going to happen to the costs that will be deducted from sales revenues as this reduced productive expenditure works its way through the system? Total sales will be less. Total profits on a pre-tax basis will be greater. 
Now, paradoxically, all taxes which are applied to profits or interest or to inheritances, whatever taxes land on funds that particularly would be saved and productively expended, those taxes raise the pre-tax rate of profit. They're paid with funds that otherwise would have shown up as costs to be deducted from sales revenues. Those costs no longer appear. In their place, we have the tax payments. But on a pre-tax basis, the income before tax is higher. Now think, what would be the effect if the corporate income tax were repealed? Let's, and the government reduced its spending by enough to make that possible. Let's say right now, the government uh, collects, I don't know what the actual figure is, but let's imagine it's $100 billion a year in corporate income taxes. Suppose the government cut its budget by $100 billion and abolished the corporate income tax. What would happen to most of the funds presently used to pay the corporate income tax? They'd be productively expended. There'd be an increase in the demand for capital goods of all kinds and labor by business. And then after a time, this additional spend, productive spending would show up as a higher level of costs. We would end up, there would be a reduction in the pre-tax rate of profit. What would happen is outlays for capital goods and labor would take the place of tax payments for the most part. The uh, rate of profit would be lower, the, uh, the pre-tax rate of profit. The after-tax rate of profit would not be lower, but the pre-tax rate would be. The consequence would be we'd have a, a greater thrust toward economic progress. Instead of the government collecting money and building unnecessary projects or giving it to people who aren't even working to just consume, you'd have these funds spent to buy machinery, equipment, and so on, and pay higher wages to people who are working. We'd have uh, a rise in production and a rise in the relative production of capital goods. Uh, we would have some considerable economic progress. And the rate of, pro as I say, the pre-tax rate of profit, profit minus all the regular costs, would be lower. The taxes, the taxes that are paid would be replaced with costs on account of capital goods and labor. All right, let's consider the effect of budget deficits. Uh, deficits, not that are financed by creating money, that's serious enough, but let's consider now uh, budget deficits of the government that are financed by selling securities to uh, individuals and businessmen. The government wants to spend more money than it collects in taxes. That's the meaning of a deficit, the excess of government spending over taxes. All right, to the extent the government does not print the money, uh, they have to go out and borrow it. Well, what would have been done with the money that is lent to the government that the government now consumes? That would have been used by business firms for the most part, also to some extent by home buyers and uh, private consumers, but for the most part by business firms to construct plant and equipment, buy machinery, and pay wages. All right, those funds are not available to business because they're being used to buy government securities and the government consumes them. Well, the sales revenues in the economy are the same however the money is spent, whether it's by business productively or by the government not productively. But productive expenditure is going to be less. And what's going to be the effect on the costs that will be deducted from sales revenues? They'll be less. We have less costs on account of capital goods and labor because the money that would have shown up as those costs is turned over to the government and the government consumes the proceeds. Well, if there are less costs, what is the effect on the nominal amount of profit? It's higher. The average rate of profit will be higher. Now, I told you a, a day or two ago the rate of profit determines the rate of interest. Can you see any connection 
uh, between these high government budget deficits that we have and high interest rates even though uh, the severity of inflation has substantially subsided. How can we explain the continuing high interest rates? <laughs> well, the government is competing for funds. You can look at it that way. That's perfectly true. But also, what is the government doing to the rate of profit? It's, it's sending up the rate of profit and the rate of interest together. We have a higher nominal rate of profit and interest than we would have if the government did not operate with a deficit. If the government balanced the budget, if the government cut spending by an amount equal to the deficit and then borrowed that much less, what would happen to the money the government now borrows? <clears throat> Most of that would go into productive expenditure and that would then show up sooner or later as a higher level of cost deducted from revenues, the amount and uh, rate of profit would be less. Now, I know it's, it may be difficult for many of you to see how can the rate of profit <coughs> be inversely related to prosperity. I'm telling you, the deficit raises the rate of profit. That's not something to be happy about. But you might think, but a high rate of profit is good. <coughs> and it's the same issue as with technological progress. It's a question of context. You could think of it this way. <coughs> It's wonderful if someone like uh, Hank Reardon uh, makes an enormous rate of profit. If he makes a 50% rate of profit, a 100% rate of profit, that's great. <clears throat> but what would be signified if at the same time uh, Oren Boyle and James Taggart are able to make 25 and 30% rates of profit? Is that healthy? No, because you have marginal Well. <clears throat> It's obvious that people like that should not be making money. They should be getting rapidly wiped out. <laughs> now, uh, even when you have uh, people like uh, Reardon and uh, all the others in, in the Valley, even they don't make all uh, very high rates of profit. It would depend on uh, how far ahead they are of the others. I think there's a little episode in Atlantis. Uh, someone is working for someone else. I think someone is working for Ted Nielsen, whoever is running the foundry. And he used to be running the foundry, but he's been put out of business because uh, <coughs> Nielsen or, or whomever is more efficient. Well, uh, even among uh, these giants, they wouldn't all be earning high rates of profit. Those would be earning the high rates of profit who are far ahead of the others so long as they're ahead. Then as the others catch up, their rates of profit are narrowed. If we look at the significance of the rate of profit uh, in the overall economy, as far as the rate of profit depends on the rate of net consumption, the rate of profit and economic prosperity are inversely related. As far as uh, the rate of profit depends on the rate of net consumption. Economic progress and prosperity are inversely related to the rate of profit. The average economy-wide rate. That doesn't mean that many individuals can't have very high rates, but then others have to have correspondingly low rates or losses. Now, the nominal rate of profit also depends on the increase in the quantity of money. As far as the nominal rate of profit depends simply on the increase in the quantity of money, if that's all that's going on, then again, the average economy-wide rate of profit is inversely related to prosperity. If all the foundation is is more money pouring in, and that'll raise the nominal rate of profit, that is not a sign of prosperity. There is only a limited range within which the economy-wide average rate of profit and prosperity have a direct relation. And that is, to the extent that we have an increase in production and supply, and then as a byproduct of that increase in production and supply, there is an increase in the quantity of commodity money, which is within the limit of the rate of increase in production, to the extent that we have this uh, addition of a monetary component within the limit of the rate of increase in production, 
To that extent, a higher rate of profit can be the accompaniment of prosperity. To concretize it, if production were going up 10% a year, and as a byproduct of that, the physical amount of gold and silver was also rising somewhere 10% or less, well, the rate of increase in gold or silver would be making an addition to the nominal rate of profit, and that, nom that addition to the nominal rate of profit would be an accompaniment of a real rate of profit. If you have uh, a context in which production, in which the rate of net consumption, let's say, is 2%, production is going up 10% a year, all right, the real rate of profit is going to be about 12%. If in that context the money supply is going up 5% even, the nominal rate will be 7 That nominal rate will be the accompaniment of a high real rate. But uh, it's only insofar as the nominal rate reflects the byproduct of an increase in production. Insofar as uh, the monetary component is a byproduct of the increase in production, only to that extent is the economy-wide average rate of profit positively related to progress and prosperity. I don't know if I've succeeded in making this. Uh, I see some people nodding yes. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I hope I've, I've communicated the point. All right, let me call your attention to something further which will connect with the issue of budget deficits. Uh, please turn back to figure three. Figure three is the easier one to work with here on page 13. And if you have your neighbor, uh, this is something that uh, is helpful if two people at a time might do it. Let the neighbor on the left with his diagram, let his figure three represent the economy of Japan. He's across the Pacific. And you're on the right. Your figure three is the economy of the United States. <clears throat> All right. Now let's pick a year in figure three. Let's say year two. And uh, Japan has. 1K of capital goods at a cost value of 400 and 1C of consumer goods at a cost value of 400. Let's imagine they physically take 10% of that. They'll take 0.1K and 0.1C, each with a cost value of 40, and they'll load it up onto giant freighters and ship it to the United States. All right. Can anyone draw an inference as to what would be the effect on the magnitude of costs deducted from sales revenues in Japan? They've shipped away 10% of their output to the United States. They're selling it in the United States. So how much do they have left to sell in Japan? They're 0.9. Now, there's the same spending of yen going on in Japan. The expenditures in Japan are depicted by these gray boxes. There's 1,000 units of money spent in Japan to buy the product of the Japanese economy. But what is the cost value of the product being sold in Japan? Well, what is the cost value? If you look in at the diagram itself, it's 360 for the capital goods and 360 for the consumer goods. The cost value would have been 800. Take away 10%. That's 80. The cost value is now 720. So what's happened to the amount of profit in Japan? It's higher, right? Now, what happens to the amount of profit in the United States when these goods arrive? We have more goods now. Uh, in the American market, we have our 1K and 1C with our cost value of uh, 400 and 400, plus we've got the 0.1K and 0.1C from Japan with their cost value of 80. What will be the total cost value of goods deducted from the sales revenue of the American economy? It would be 880, it would be higher. Okay, now the point here, if you look at this in isolation, 
the uh, imports into a country uh, operate to reduce the amount and, and rate of profit in that country. A country which has net exports adds to the amount and rate of profit. Now you might be thinking, well, this means something, uh, which, uh, something unpleasant. But let's now hold the context. Let's put this together with the federal budget deficits that I talked about just a moment ago. The effect of our budget deficits is to raise the amount and rate of profit in the United States. The government is drawing away funds that would have gone to productive expenditure. If, if all we had was our government with its deficit, the effect would be a sharp drop in productive expenditure, a major rise in the rate of profit in the United States, and we would suffer very dearly. Well, here's this rise in the rate of profit and interest in the United States. And what does that do to the United States as a place to invest from the perspective of uh, people like Japanese? They'll want to invest. And when they ship their goods here, well, the money that they obtain in selling their goods, they want to use a lot of that money in investing. Let's say Toyota ships a shipload of cars. Toyota has dollars for the cars. Now, to some extent, Toyota needs to convert dollars back to yen because they have to pay their workers in Japan in yen. They have to buy many of their parts and supplies for yen in Japan. But they'll use a good chunk of the dollars that they've earned in Japan, uh, in here in the United States, to invest in the United States. And then there are other companies in Japan that have yen that they could invest but they have a choice. Do they want to invest in Japan with yen, or should they buy some of the dollars from Toyota and invest in the United States? Now, if our deficit has made the rate of profit and interest higher in the United States than in Japan, they'll be likely to want to invest here. So the effect of this uh, import surplus is not actually to reduce our rate of profit to some low level. It's to offset the artificial rise being caused by the government budget deficit. It's a way of channeling the effects of our government budget deficits across the wider world market. Instead of our government's budget deficit radically raising the rate of profit here and wiping out capital in the United States and devastating our economy, to some significant degree, uh, the burden is shared across the world, and Japan is the uh, largest single country that is helping us out in this respect. They are shipping in goods to make good the deficiency that our government budget deficit is causing. So uh, the reduction in the rate of profit accompanying this uh, import surplus is mainly an offset of the rise in the rate of profit that would otherwise be caused by the budget deficit. If we could close the budget deficit, then I believe that would very quickly be followed by uh, closing the so-called trade deficit. If our domestic rate of profit and interest fell, then the Japanese would not have uh, the motive to uh, invest as heavily in the United States. And then, when they sold in the States, if Toyota sells a shipload of cars in the United States, and Toyota does not want to invest in the US, and other firms in Japan don't want Toyota's dollars to invest in the United States, then what will Toyota have to do with its dollars? Uh, someone said, by Treasury bills, you're dropping the context. If the rate of profit and interest is lower, they don't want our treasury bills. <laughs> yes? They would have to buy American exports. Now, you might say, well, what will suddenly make them do that? If they don't want to invest, if they don't want to invest, what can Japanese do with dollars? <laughs> they. They could be tourists or whatever. They can't eat the dollars. The only use 
to the citizens of one country of the currency of another country, the only basic use is to buy things in that other country. Now you might think, all right, but aren't our goods so expensive? Well, what would happen if, uh, let's say our goods start out, they're very expensive, but here are Japanese, they've got dollars, they no longer want to invest in the United States. What they want is yen to buy things in Japan. So they're not using dollars to invest. They're not seeking dollars to invest. Whatever dollars they're getting, they want to get yen for. Well, what's going to happen to the price of the yen? And as the price of the yen goes up, what happens? That, that means dollars are getting cheaper relative to yen. You're offering more dollars for the same yen. What is that doing to the price of American goods from the perspective of Japanese? It's going down and raising the price of Japanese from the perspective of Americans. All right, a consequence would be uh, the exchange rate uh, would tend to change, yen would get more expensive, dollars less expensive, but I don't think that would be the whole story. What would happen if we no longer have these government budget deficits and American firms are in a position to start modernizing because they've got uh, the capital that the government had been absorbing? and add to that some significant deregulation, what will be the effect on the costs of producing in America and the quality of American goods? The costs will tend to go down and the quality to go up, and that means that American goods become attractive without such a radical deterioration in the exchange rate. See, uh, if we abolished the deficits and uh, substantially reduced the regulation, made possible more capital formation, well then a consequence would also be the ending of this uh, alleged problem with Japan. That would be a further consequence. All right, I'm going to uh, cover here uh, something I had wanted to be sure to cover, and I wasn't quite sure where to put it. Uh, you could have raised a question. Uh, maybe you're satisfied by the handout. Uh, I'm telling you that the rate of profit is determined under an invariable money by the rate of net consumption. That if the capitalists productively expend less and personally consume more, the rate of profit goes up. And no one has raised the question, am I saying that the way for a company to raise its profits is to have a party? <clears throat> I mean, that might appear to be an implication. <clears throat> uh, the proposition is that if businessmen and capitalists in the economy as a whole consume more and productively expend less, the rate of profit will be higher. But this does not work for any individual. If you turn to page 14, let me review my argument with you, uh, for you on that. This is point five. Why an individual capitalist cannot increase his rate of profit by deciding to consume more? <clears throat> well, let's imagine we have one company uh, in our economy in figure three, one company whose own individual capital is nine. The economy of the, the, the capital of the entire economy is 1800. I'm going to take a, an imaginary individual company with a capital of nine. That's one half of one percent of the economy. That would be the size of the largest of companies. All right, here we are, this one company with a capital of nine presently is able to earn a profit of one. It has nine of capital. Its capital is nine. The capital in the whole economy is 1,800. The profit in the whole economy is 200. We'll assume that this company is of average efficiency. It produces 
uh, in proportion to its capital at the rate of the average company in the economy. So if this company has one half of one percent of the capital of the economy, it is in a position to earn one half of one percent of the profit of the economy. Its amount of profit will be one. All right, suppose the uh, owners of this company have heard half of what I've said and they're half convinced and they decide, well, we're foolish to keep a capital of nine and each year consume our profit of one. Why don't we consume two and reduce our capital to eight? Well, what's going to happen? The total capital in the economy, instead of being 1,800, will be 1,799. This firm has a capital of eight, net consumption in the economy and profit in the economy will be 201, but what will happen to the profit of this company? This is less, eight seventeen ninety ninths, that's less almost in the ratio of eight to nine. If you worked it out, eight seventeen ninety ninths times 201 is less. The point is, any one individual who would decide to consume more adds to profits in the economy, but not his own. He's depleting his own capital, he's depleting his capital at a much more rapid rate than he's adding to the profits of the economy. Look at it this way. The biggest, richest companies uh, have only a relatively small fraction of the capital of the whole economy. If they want to uh, add to net consumption, they can use up their entire capitals. They'll wipe out their capitals 100%, but the total of net consumption in the whole economy is so large, they're not able to raise net consumption by nearly the same kind of percentage as they reduce their own capital. You wipe yourself out much faster than you can add anything of significance to the total profit of the economy. If, if I wanted to raise profits in the economy, all right, I could toss in a few thousand dollars. TJS could join the effort to raise net consumption in the economy, and we can contribute whatever we have. All right, TJS goes from wherever it is down to zero. Profits in the economy are enlarged a smidgen. The enlargement is not going to work to the benefit of TJS. The motive of each individual, no individual business firm can pay any attention to the effect of his action on the total profit of the economy. Now, while we're on this subject, uh, an implication is uh, that those individual businessmen and capitalists who save the most and consume the least always benefit by doing so and tend to become relatively more and more significant. Let's start with figure three. We have net consumption of 200, an average rate of profit of 200 over 1800. Now there are all kinds of different individuals consuming their uh, revenues and incomes at different rates. Suppose we have a company with a capital of nine that instead of consuming its profit of one completely, it consumes only one half and next year has nine and a half of capital. It adds half of its profit to its capital. There is another firm somewhere that instead of consuming just one, consumes one and a half. In other words, this 200 over 1800 is a composite, it's an average. There will be different individual firms who are consuming above the net consumption rate and others below the net consumption rate. Well, what happens to those whose consumption is below the net consumption rate, below the average rate, below the rate of profit? What happens to their capitals if the, if the rate of profit, if the rate of profit is one-eighteenth? Correction, one-ninth. 
and you're consuming at less than that, you're consuming at 125th. The rate of profit is 11%, you're consuming 4%. What's happening to you? Your capital is increasing. You have $100, you're making $11, you're only consuming $4, you're adding $7 to your capital. Now those who are uh, making $11 and consuming $15 or $18, what's happening to them? They're going down. Well now if we project this over time, can you see any tendency of a gravitation of capital? Where will capital gravitate? To those who have the lowest rates of consumption. The capital is constantly gravitating to those with the lowest rates of consumption. They become relatively bigger, and an implication is the overall economy-wide average rate of net consumption will ultimately be dictated by those with the lowest rates. If those with the lowest rates are of the same efficiency, if they earn the same rate of profit, imagine if all business firms did earn the same rate of profit, and that rate of profit is determined by the rate of net consumption, those business firms accumulate capital that consume at a rate less than the rate of profit, those business firms lose capital that consume at a rate more than the rate of profit. And ultimately, all the capital would tend to be in the hands of those with the lowest rates of consumption. Now, when we allow for the increase in the quantity of money, the principle is still the same. Suppose, uh, instead of the overall economy-wide average rate of profit, being dictated just by the rate of net consumption, there's this monetary component. Well, <coughs> even though everyone might be saving something, even though everyone might be, be consuming below the rate of profit and they're all adding something, who'll be adding the most? Those who consume the least. There is this tendency for those with the lowest rates of consumption to grow relative to those with higher rates of consumption. And there is one further relevant factor while we're at it. Not all businessmen and capitalists are of the same degree of efficiency. There are radical differences. They don't all earn the same rate of profit. Those businessmen and capitalists who earn the highest rates of profit are the most efficient. Uh, while the average rate is 11%, there will be some who earn 20 or 30, others who earn 1 or 2 or minus 5. All right. Capital gravitates to those businessmen and capitalists who are the most efficient and the highest saving. It's a combination of efficiency and parsimony. The capital of the economy is constantly gravitating toward those who are the most efficient, who earn the highest rates of profit, and, and then who save most heavily out of their profits. Capital is constantly moving toward them. So the, the, this is a dynamic principle. that I, call, I think of it as the gravitation of relative wealth and income. The wealth in the economy is constantly gravitating into the hands of those who earn the highest rates of profit through their efficiency and who save the most heavily. And you can see the passage of fortunes, like uh, where are the uh, heirs of the Vanderbilts and Astors today? Uh, the descendants of Astor and Vanderbilt were not among the most efficient, not among the highest saving. Others who become more efficient, who earn higher rates of profit and who save more heavily, they surpass them. All right, there's a, an awful lot more I would like to go into. I'm going to concentrate Saturday on the question of saving. I hope somewhere to make time to complete the, the uh, discussion of the fact that, uh, of the relationship between the activity of an individual and the money he makes, and the fact that in the economy as a whole, uh, money and production are very separate and distinct. Okay, thank you very much.
Now it's time for questions. Yes, this gentleman right here. In uh, figure four, you've assumed that uh, we've got a stable economy and the people are not being bothered by government, and that's why we've done the 40 60 split for capital goods. Yeah, I'm, think, I'm assuming in figure four, uh, the question is am I assuming in figure four um, that we have a stable economy because the government is not intervening? seem to have also assumed along with that that the, there will also be always an increasing supply of gold. Why in a stable situation would you expect less and less gold to do the same job if, if things were stable? All right, a, a couple of points. Uh, why, if things are stable in figure four, why am I assuming more gold? Yes. Are there a lot of different points? That, all, right. all right, let's start from the uh, end and go backwards. In figure four, there is no increase in the money supply. In figure four, the money supply is constant. The stability in figure four, it's not really stable. What's happening to production in every year? It's going up. You could call figure four uh, a dynamic equilibrium. There are certain aspects of stability. The monetary elements are stable. But as far as physical production goes, that is continuing to improve. Real wages are constantly rising. Uh, what's stable is the money income of the average wage earner, the nominal rate of profit. But real wages are rising through falling prices. The absolute amount of real profit keeps going up through falling prices, while the nominal rate stays the same. Now, what would make this sort of situation possible, it doesn't have to be 100% uh, laissez-faire, but it has to be something a lot, lot closer to it than what we have now. You have to have uh, enough freedom, at least, so that people are motivated to provide for the future and to have a sufficiently high relative production of capital goods, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I don't know if there's any further elements in your question that I'm missing. Well, when you talk about these, these progressive situations, like yeah. where the economy is progressing, uh, you've always, and most economists always assume that the supply of gold will continue to go up. Okay, and you asked. Not necessarily so. Why couldn't it go down since it would, uh, in a st stable situation, there'd be less demand for it? Okay, you're saying, why am I assuming that the supply of gold goes up? All right, now, in figure four, I don't. Figure four is conducted on the assumption of a rigidly fixed quantity of money and volume of spending. But I do believe, in reality, as the general overall ability to produce rises, there will be some significant increase in gold production. Now, I did not always believe that until about until I wrote The Government Against the Economy, I thought, uh, in the case of gold, perhaps we'd reach the time where we've got all the gold and then we really do have a fixed quantity of money. But in writing The Government Against the Economy and dealing with the ecology scare and we're depleting the Earth's precious resources and all, I came to the conclusion that from a physical chemical point of view, all of the world and the solar system and the universe consists of solidly packed chemical elements, all of the planetary bodies. And from the point of view of an analysis of physical quantities, even the rarest metals exist in an enormous abundance compared to anything we've touched. And the whole problem of natural resources is never any physical lack out there it's a question of how much of what is out there that for practical purposes is infinite, how much can we gain access to without having to use too much of our effort. So from that point of view, there's a vast amount of gold even that's still out there. There's huge quantities in trace amounts in the oceans. So I think even if one wanted the supply of gold to stay the same, it, in fact, will not. As we increase our general ability to produce, there will be increases in gold, and so it is more realistic to allow for that. 
It's for the same reason that we can have more steel or more plastic or whatever, uh, as a byproduct of that process, we can also have more gold. It doesn't have to be one to one, but there will be some. Uh, Mr. Dunn. Uh, should the uh, expenditures by government for highways and uh, power plants and so forth be regarded as capital goods? Okay, excellent question. Should the expenditure by government for highways, uh, power plants, you said, or bridges and tunnels, should government expenditure for things of a kind which do in fact make a real contribution to physical production, should they be counted as capital goods? <clears throat> and my answer is that so long as they are owned by the government, they are consumers' goods. And the way to uh, treat them in the analysis I've presented, they're consumer goods which make a contribution to the productivity of the capital goods. The fact that we have highways and bridges and tunnels and so forth uh, make it possible for us to accomplish much more with the steel mills that are privately owned and are genuine capital goods. Now, the reason I call the government's bridges, tunnels, whatever, and government steel mills, anything that the government owns uh, I would call a consumer's good, is because the uh, government's motive in the operation is not to make money. The government is making expenditures not for the purpose of making sales at a profit. A capital good is a good purchased for the purpose of making subsequent sales, implicitly at a profit. I explained uh, at the last TJS conference that I thought this was crucial to the distinction between capital goods and consumer goods. Because notice, anything you buy, sooner or later, is used up and worn out and needs replacement. If you are not using it for the purpose of bringing in sales revenues, what is going to make possible its replacement? How does the government maintain the roads and its bridges and tunnels. Where do they get the money for that? Through taxation. They're consumer goods. The government spends money for them. They get used up and worn out. They don't make possible their own replacement. Now, if they were privately owned toll roads, uh, the tolls would be the source of replacement. It, it, private business buys for the sake of selling at a profit the sales proceeds then make possible the replacement. These are truly not consumer goods, they're capital goods. They make possible their own replacement plus more. With the government, most of the time, they're not even charging. When they do charge, making money is not their real motive. Even if the government charges, like it charges for postage stamps. But uh, a profit is not the motive of the post office. And as a result, the post office will have a huge number of unnecessary employees. It's not an accident that they run at deficits virtually every year. Profit is not their motive. It's not necessary. They're not operating with their own money, which is limited. They're not, they can just turn to the taxpayers. Now, I would say the so-called infrastructure, when it's government-owned, is in the category of consumers' goods. It ought to be privately owned. If it were, it would be in the category of capital goods. They would be operated more efficiently also. Uh, but as it stands, uh, they're consumer goods that are making some contribution to production, a lesser contribution than they would make if they were privately owned, but they're still basically consumer goods. Uh, this gentleman right here. How would my discussion of the uh, trade deficit and the budget deficit differ if the money were gold rather than, uh, than fiat money? I don't think it would be different in any significant way. I, I, I couldn't tell you how it would be different. You wouldn't have to spend the gold back in the country of origin. Pardon me? You wouldn't have to spend the gold back in the country of origin. The gold that they got from the United States for spending on consumers would not have to go back to the United States. You're saying uh, if we had a gold standard, 
uh, the gold that the Japanese obtained in the United States would not have to go back to the United States. The gold, what? Gold coin. All right, but if the United States has a higher rate of profit uh, than uh, Japan, they would want to invest more heavily here. Now, where there'd be a difference, uh, I can see where a difference would arise uh, if they decide they don't want to invest in the United States, then uh, they're not going to uh, simply say, well, we can only spend the gold in Japan. They, they, if, they're, if they're making dollars in the United States and they don't want to invest the dollars, they have to buy yen, and that will raise the price of yen. Uh, that would not be present. And at the, uh, off the top of my head, I, I don't think I can give you a fully satisfactory answer right now. I'd have to do a little thinking about it. Uh, the lady next to you, yes. Uh, you're, you're Mrs. 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 Olsha. Right. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, you're making the point, this inverse relationship between the rate of profit and prosperity could be used by ignorant or dishonest people as an argument for more government intervention. Uh, do I see that happening? Yes, I do. Uh, and It's not only or even primarily in connection uh, with a high rate of net consumption, but just think of inflation. The creation of money adds to the nominal rate of profit. At the same time, it raises prices, and most of the additional profit is required to replace assets at higher prices. And one of the most deadly consequences of inflation is that it makes everyone believe that business is prosperous just because the rate of profit is high, and they ignore the fact that most of that profit is needed for replacement at higher prices. And meanwhile, they're being taxed to death. You have to pay taxes on the nominal rate of profit, and most of that profit is required to replace assets at higher prices, so you can't replace. And yet people say, look, profits have never been higher. What are you complaining about? It would be very helpful if the public could understand that the nominal rate of profit on an average basis uh, can be inversely related to prosperity. Now, it would be hard to argue with demagogues because they, they could pick those individual companies that had high rates of profit because they were in the forefront, and those companies would, in fact, be prospering. Like, if you pick uh, the profits of Apple Computer, you couldn't say that the high profits of Apple Computer are a proof of its decline. But you could very well argue that the profits of Con Edison uh, can be a proof of its decline because those profits are not adequate to make possible replacement. Uh, over at the end here. Under a gold standard, you have constantly falling prices so that a given unit of gold over time will buy more and more goods. That would be, the question is, with, or is there more to it? Yes, sir. Okay. OK, the question is, uh, under a gold standard, would prices be falling from year to year indefinitely? And uh, would the point be reached where uh, gold would simply be too valuable uh, to conduct many transactions? And would you need something else? All right, with a gold standard, I certainly think you could have very long periods of falling prices. I don't know if that, that would be constant. It might be. It depends if production were always, if, if, if the, the production of ordinary goods were always outstripping gold, then prices would always fall. That could happen. Uh, but people, when we talk about more production, people would be buying more bigger things. Like more production would represent you substitute an automobile for a motorcycle, or a better automobile for a poorer automobile, or a bigger house. To a large extent, 
uh, you're buying bigger sized units. You don't have the problem of the subdivision. But you wouldn't have to wait generations for a problem to arise. If we started off with gold now, the present value of gold that would have to exist under 100% gold reserve would make gold uh, too valuable for many day-to-day -day transactions. If you think that uh, gold today is uh, about $400 an ounce, if we wanted to have a 100% reserve gold standard, an ounce of gold uh, might well have the buying power of something like $3,000 an ounce. And then you might realize the smallest practical size gold coin uh, is perhaps 1 20th of an ounce. Then you're talking of 1 20th of 3,000. That's like $150. The buying power of gold is very, very high. And you probably would not use gold to buy your groceries. And this is why when gold was a full-bodied money, alongside of gold, there was silver, which had a much lower value. I think uh, an implication of a 100% reserve gold standard is uh, a parallel standard of silver at the same time for this very reason that you're indicating. Let me just take one last question, Mr. Kameen. Okay, Mr. Kameen is saying that his understanding of objectivism is that if one company makes a profit, all companies should make a profit. And my example of the computer company appears to contradict his understanding of objectivism. All right, I think I can reconcile this. What objectivism holds, and don't even make me speak for objectivism, what I hold is that there is a harmony of the rightly understood material self-interests of all men. So that when this computer company gains, uh, all others will end up tending to gain. This does not mean that everyone who is today in the computer business will gain by virtue of staying in the computer business. <coughs> he may go bankrupt and be wiped out. Uh, when the automobile was developed, uh, many horse breeders and blacksmiths were driven out of business. Now, the way everybody ends up gaining, let's say we've got someone who started his own small computer company, which is now going to fail, and he will be driven out of business. What will he have to do? He's not going to die of starvation. He no longer can be the president of a company. What will he have to do? He'll have to take a job. He'll have to become an ordinary wage earner. But what is happening to the ordinary wage earners in a progressing economy? their standard of living is going up. You see, the less efficient people do not have a right to remain as company presidents. They may have to work as ordinary workers or vice presidents or whatever. But if the uh, effect of all this is we have a dynamic, progressing economy, then everyone becomes better off. And in time, the average wage earner is better off than a millionaire of a generation or two before. Now. Uh, you can have a situation, uh, what will, might uh, disturb you a little more perhaps, but I think can be resolved easily. If we have a constant quantity of money, if we have an economy with an invariable quantity of money, 
what is the implication of anyone doing anything which earns more money for him? Let's imagine we have, we start out, uh, everyone is earning roughly, every wage earner, let's imagine, is earning roughly the same wage. Now, 10% of the wage earners decide to become, work, to work harder, they become more skilled. This 10% doubles its productivity. All right, what's the effect on total production in the economy if 10% double their productivity? There's a 10% increase. We used to have 10 tenths producing one unit. Now, one tenth produces two tenths. Total production is 11 tenths. What part of the total limited money income will this 10% receive? They're accounting for two elevenths of the output now. They used to produce one tenth of the output, now they're producing two elevenths. They'll make almost double, right? Now here's a case, the individual produces more and he makes roughly double. Any, if you have 10% of the economy producing double, they will now make two elevenths of the income. What are they doing to the income of the other nine tenths if there's a fixed total amount of money? Those nine-tenths will end up making less money. They'll make nine-elevenths of the money. Does this imply a conflict of interest? On the surface, it might. But what I would like the opportunity to show at some point, and you might work it out yourself if you take the trouble, is to the extent that one particular group earns more money by virtue of increasing its relative share of total production, the fall in prices is precisely great enough to fully offset the reduced money incomes of the rest of the economy. The one group will end up doubling its real buying power when we allow for their higher incomes and the reduction in prices, and the other group, the reduction in prices will precisely offset their lower income. And now we can uh, integrate this fully with objectivism. Let's say we have one part of the population which, if fully free, will increase its own productivity tenfold. The highest 1% of the population can increase its own productivity tenfold. And they'll now account not for 1% of the income, but something moving in the direction of 10%. But as a, process, as a result of this 1% being able to increase its productivity so dramatically, these are people who now become company presidents. They found new industries. The consequence of their action is to double the productivity of the other 90%. Well, in an economy with a fixed quantity of money, the money incomes of the 90% would drop, but there would be a reduction in prices that far outweighed the reduction in their money incomes. So I believe uh, fully in the harmony of the rightly understood self-interests of all people. You just have to know how to work it out. I think it takes some economic analysis to do it. And uh, this is why I think that objectivism uh, and economics really go together. The economics of the classical and Austrian economists, starting in the economics is a product of the Enlightenment. And the leading philosophical doctrine of economics as taught by the classical economists is the harmony of the rightly understood material self-interest of all men. Economics shows how each of us can go ahead, pursue our own material self-interest, and so long as we don't resort to force or fraud, we are not making anybody else suffer. The fundamental thrust of our action is to benefit everybody else. There can be temporary cases where people need to make an adjustment. Uh, if I'm producing automobiles and you insist on being a blacksmith, you'll have a hard time. But you can change, and when you make the change, you benefit from my having produced the automobile. Uh, I'll be glad to discuss any alleged cases of conflicts, because uh, that's what I'm really most interested in. Well, thank you very, very much.